Hey, it's Coach with Tactical Hive. We got a little something different for you today. Uh, uh, me and a friend were sitting around thinking about what film for video, and we realized that we, between the two of us and maybe a couple other friends, either owned or had access to every main battle rifle from the Spanish-American War back in, you know, before 1900 up until today. So we brought them all out here and we're gonna go through them a little bit, just hit the wave tops. Uh, you know, you, you, you know, guys that geek out on this stuff, awesome. If I screw something up, tell me in the comments, okay? I'm not a, uh, a technician, I'm an operator. So this is the operator's view. Anyway, so we're gonna start with the uh, Craig Jorgensen and end with the modern M4. Starting off the lineup, we have the Craig Jorgensen. Uh, this was used in the Spanish-American War, and it was the first U.S. military repeating rifle, as far as I know. It fired a 30-40 Craig, like this here, okay, and it's got uh, that rim right there, which was popular back in the day. And they didn't have any feeding devices. You just grabbed a handful of these suckers and dumped them in here somehow worked them in and then you close it up and loader not the most efficient thing uh, in fact we used these in the spanish american war and even though we won that thing handily it didn't matter we they're smart enough guys and you know what that mauser that were those guys were shooting at us with was a better gun so that leads us to the next rifle based on the mauser All right, then to answer the Spanish Mauser, we rolled up here to the uh, 03 Springfield. And we have uh, a feeding device here and shoots a 30 out six cartridge, uh, five rounds, and you just in the stripper clip guide and press it all in. Now we're loaded, okay? We're on a range, so I can load these things, you geeks out there. All right, anyway, so it was a Mauser. Uh, this served uh, all the way through World War II, but they didn't have enough of them. And Army Ordnance said, no, we need something else a lot faster. And then we'll, that brings us to the next gun on the list. Okay, so this is this one is the next one on the list. This is the this is the P14 uh, Enfield, the P17 or uh, M17 uh, Enfield is what America had, but this one's in 303. That's the only difference. The Brits during World War One didn't have enough guns or the uh, ability to make as many guns as they needed, so they contracted over with American companies, and we made them a bunch of these. And then America got into the war and went, well, hell, we're already tooled up for these. We'll just put them in 30 out six. And there was actually way more of these running around on the battlefields over there in France and everywhere else than there were 03 Springfields. But after the war, they went ahead and retired this one. This one gave you uh, aperture sights. Probably has the best sighting system of all the weapons in World War I. It's not just me, there's other experts out there there's, that agree with that, and I agree with them. After the war, they decommissioned these, sent them off, and went back to the 03 Springfield until we get to the next gun on our list. All right, so the next one on the list is good old M1 Garand. Anybody who's seen a World War II flick? has seen this thing in action. Okay, we went from the uh, stripper clip to now an M block clip. This holds eight rounds of, well, normally it would be a 30-06. This one here shoots 308. So 
uses the same clip. You just line it up here on the guide, shove it in. And if you have your, catch that with your, uh, the base of your hand there, that'll keep you from getting that grand thumb. Whereas if you miss this slide, the uh, bolt's gonna come forward when I let go. If it doesn't, then just give it a little slap. And now we're in business. Now I've got eight rounds of uh, heavy caliber uh, uh, ammunition to go ahead and uh, take care of business with. Now, after that eight rounds, we got that clip in there. It goes pinging out and makes that ping sound. And uh, old Fudlore says, you know, that's when the, uh, the bad guys would hear the clip, you know, pinging out and then they come charge you. And as anybody who's ever been in a firefight knows, your ears shut down like that. And back then, they weren't wearing an ear pro. So, you know, you ask any of your World War II vets, but you gotta ask loud because they're deaf as hell. This one had a little brother for all the troops. It was a, the very first PDW, basically. And that's the, uh, the M1 carbine, and that's next. Here we have the M1 carbine. Gotta thank Vince for this one. And this was his uncle's. And he uh, acquired it in the Republic of South Vietnam. Uh, had an altercation with a little fella in black pajamas. Uh, ended up the M14 won that day. And he went and picked this sucker up off the, uh, the enemy's body. And he noticed as he cleared the weapon that a blade of grass had gotten in there and jammed the gun and it had been fired. There was the, the grass was just enough to keep that thing from going off. So uh, his luck was, <laughs> hopefully he went and bought a lottery ticket at the end of the day. Anyhow, but so these were around for a long time. They came in a couple different versions. Uh, the first ones, um, you know, just pre-war, I think it was 1938. When they came in, they had a much uh, cruder, Sighting system. This is a later example. It's got uh, uh, the better sighting system. Originally, it came out with these, they had these short magazines, and then later on, they started getting these. And uh, the World War II guys I know, when they start talking about this stuff, the, the guys who didn't like this gun were the ones that kept the magazines. The guys who loved this gun were the guys who replaced those magazines. You basically used them as uh, you know, uh, consumables. They just chucked them and got new ones. And apparently they're very well supplied most places and you can get them real easy. Uh, anyways, it's a lightweight gun, mainly issued to you know, tank crews and basically anybody who wasn't gonna carry that uh, you know, nine pound uh, you know, M1 Garand around with them. So if you got another job, and you know, but fighting the enemy wasn't your uh, your your main job, you know, with the rifle, uh, you got one of these. Uh, but they got real popular because this will work. This has the muzzle energy of a 357 at 200 yards. It's plenty to you know for short range, shorter ranges. If you're not shooting somebody past 200 yards, hell, this is what I'd want. And then uh, post war, I mean, this one obviously got over to Vietnam. Uh, because, well, we gave it to them. We gave the South Vietnamese, the Arvin, just tons of these because we had them laying around. Prison guards, you know, everybody had, a, had one of these and uh, I never had a chance to get one, but it's on my list. Okay, so the next one kind of went off of this. They wanted to replace, the, you know, Army, peacetime Army, probably the scariest thing anybody can think about. Um, they wanted to replace all these different weapon systems with one gun, and that's the next one. So this is not your original M14. This got the same mechanism, shoots the same magazines, all that. This particular one uh, has a few mods to it. The idea behind this gun was it was supposed to take the place of the submachine gun, carbine, the battle rifle, and the Browning automatic rifle. So they gave it their best shot. Of course, they're all at that point shooting 308, which is a heavy caliber, and you don't need that for close-in stuff like that you would be using a, a uh, submachine gun for. Anyway, 
it didn't last very long. This particular one is near and dear to my heart because this is an M1A. I actually carried it for three platoons because I was a point man and I didn't like the length on the M14 and you never shot those things full auto anyway. You ain't gonna hit anything. So started out with, uh, I had a little folding stock on it and then I went with, uh, I had a, a wooden pistol grip stock and then, uh, and this one's a, uh, a McMillan fiberglass stock, but trimmed off a little bit to, you know, as we started to square up a little bit more on our shooting rather than standing sideways and, you know, uh, throwing the, the chicken wing out there. Anyway, so this one, it has the, uh, the, the dubious uh, honor of being the shortest lived uh, US battle rifle, but that's just in its main capacity because later on, I'll show you another one that we brought out of mothballs. So the next one on the list is good old M16A1, which started out as kind of the idea was a PDW, uh, lightweight, you know, rifle for you know, folks that didn't always need a rifle. So by way of testing, Curtis LeMay saw this thing shoot a watermelon at a 4th of July party, that's what the legend is. And he went, hey, that is awesome, I want them. So the Air Force were the first ones on board and they bought it for sentry duty. Because those, you know, Air Force guys who are not known for their physique could carry, you know, something a little bit lighter and not get tired. You Air Force guys, I love you. Okay, uh, anyway, so I, we bought a bunch of them. It turned out it's a good idea. It's lightweight, it's effective. It had some early growing pains and a lot of guys out there were like, oh, that thing's a piece of crap. It'll... Yeah, no, this thing is probably one of the most reliable guns out there and it would rival the AK-47 and I'll stand by that. And if you don't believe me, talk to the guys over there at InRange where they do the mud test and they shove stuff on there and then shoot it, okay? It's a very reliable rifle and I've been carrying one of these or a variant in buds, we got issued these. My first platoon started with a CAR-15 as a rear security, swapped over to that M14, uh, did what, three more platoons with that. And then when I moved on to uh, greener pastures, uh, we got the more modern stuff and started getting carbines and MP5s and all this other cool stuff. But uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, and this one was built from a kit. So it's a, a a uh, authentic 1970s everything all through here. And it uh, shows a little wear, but I kind of like that. So that leads us to this one. Uh, this is actually, this is the last death row, of the 600 series with the, uh, the carrying handle. And uh, this is a civilian version, obviously, that I built that is exactly like my secondary gun when I first got the damn neck. So now this is uh, an example of what we carried initially. This was not my house gun. This is for uh, a special mission that we had going on at the time. Anyway, good gun, nice and light, has the one in 12 twist, you know, which honestly I think it's a, a, a better, it's a better twist for the lightweight 55 grain ammo has good terminal ballast, uh, ballistics. Anyway, so that's where we're at there. And we moved up to the next one. All right, so the next main battle rifle here is the M16A2. Um, the biggest difference here is that it's a one in seven twist designed to spin the more, the, uh, the heavier 62 grain green tipped ammunition. Uh, the one in 12 wouldn't stabilize it. So they went with that, they increased the weight of the barrel so you could shoot it a little, uh, a little more accurately when it warmed up and it wouldn't have that, that shift that you sometimes get. You still have your carrying handle, which isn't really a carrying handle, but they uh, went ahead and put this overly uh, complex sight on the back here that's not, well, you don't really need it for battlefield conditions. It starts showing up uh, in the late 80s sometime. If you know ex the exact date, pff, hit me up in the comments. I'd love to know. But you know, Panama, I think some uh, guys were, were getting some of these, uh, but by the Gulf War, 
everybody had one. So early 90s, definitely, this is what you had running around. Good gun still. Oh, they also, they, they lengthened the buttstock a little bit. And again, I don't agree with that. I, you know, I'm not that big a guy, but as you start, as we started working with, uh, with body armor more, you want to square your stance up more to keep your body armor towards the threat. So instead of standing sideways like this, you're squaring off and that, that just makes this really long. Anyway, yep, so, uh, and then we started moving to something a bit smaller and a bit lighter, and that's the next one. So then we moved up and on to the uh, M4. Biggest difference here, I mean, the barrel is still heavy. It's got a little notch here so you can uh, put your M203, you can clamp on there, uh, your grenade launcher, if that's what you're you know, setting up for. You know, the whole beauty of this thing is it's so damn modular. Um, now the, the M4, it, it, this one's dressed up in, in part of the SOP mod kit, the uh, special operations peculiar modifications. Okay, so we had uh, uh, the, the rail system up here that you could attach lights and lasers and whatnot, you know, your uh, foregrip to, which honestly was a boon to mankind at the time. It was like, holy crap, how do we, how did we not think of this earlier? Um, it's got a telescoping stock. Uh, this is a civilian version, obviously, so it's semi-out only, but the uh, military version, some of these had uh, three round bursts, you know, and obviously full auto. And for most of the stuff that we were doing, the good old aim point was plenty. You put a red dot up and out there and you're good to at least 200, maybe 300 yards. So no problems there. This, uh, I spent a lot of time with a gun just like this and got real comfortable with it. So again, M16, family of weapons. You know, this is the 900 series, you know, as we, you know, you know, we start, the first one was the 600, 700, and they skipped all over eight, and this is 900. And the, the rail, instead of having the, ca the carrying handle, they put a rail on here. So we it just made it modular as hell and, uh, and very effective. So in the early 2000s, Guys were like, hey, you know, this lightweight bullet is great and everything, but we want a battle rifle. So enough guys complained. They went, okay, here you go. So they started developing this. This is the EBR. Uh, again, it's, the, it's an M14. M14 in a chassis stock. In my opinion, it's a bit heavy, but it is effective. This is the uh, Mod 1. The Mod 0 had this really overly contrived buttstock. And uh, so when I got to Warcom at the time, I said, hey, get that thing off of there and just put the M4 butt st or, uh, uh, tube on there. And then you can put all kinds of different buttstocks on. And so we went with that. And I think this is actually the, uh, the first prototype of that one. They didn't get it back. Uh, anyway, sh so still shoots a uh, 7.62 got all your rails that you need. You can mount lights and lasers and stuff and make it even heavier. And then this has got a cantilever uh, scope mount on it from LaRue. And that just gives you a good eye relief over the top here and doesn't cause any issues with ejection. This one's, uh, honestly, I don't shoot it very much because it's just heavy as hell. It's a, it's a pain ass to carry around, but when you need 7.62, this one would give it to you. And as we go with that, at the same time, we decided uh, that we needed a complete new gun that was going to replace your M16 family of weapons. They were trying to replace the M4, and that's where the SCAR program came in. Came in as a 5.56 weapon, but that wasn't a big enough jump uh, in technology over the uh, M16 family. So that part got scrapped. The SCAR light went away. And we went to the SCAR Heavy. So this is the SCAR Heavy. It's heavy, but not as heavy as that EBR. Uh, actually, it's not even that heavy. It's about, it's less than eight pounds. It's one of the lightest 308s 
um, that you could, uh, you know, that we could get our hands on. It's got an extruded aluminum uh, upper, uh, polymer lower, has shoots 20 round magazines. Uh, you know, uh, this one has a few mods on it, but again, you've got all your rail space, lights, optics, foregrips, all this cool stuff. This one, I took off the, uh, the regular stock, the, the folding stock, and uh, put on a little more solid, you know. I, I mean, honestly, that stock looks like an Ugg boot. Um, this one's just a little bit nicer. It's got a little more better feel to it than, uh, than the original. Decent gun, again, it had uh, some, some growing pains early on. Um, some miscommunication with new equipment feeling. And uh, yeah, so it got a bad rep out, out of the box, just like the M16. But it's proven itself over and over again uh, in, on the battlefield. You can reach out and uh, touch people way out there, okay? So uh, uh, a buddy of mine, on his one of his last deployments, he was over there long after I retired. But uh, he's a sniper and he's making shots out, you know, 900,000 yards. And he showed me a picture of him and his, uh, his element and everybody's carrying a scar. I said, oh, they like those, huh? He goes, yeah. I had my guys were shooting guys out to eight, 900 yards with the damn scar, okay? Just being security for the sniper. So um, uh, it's a, a good, accurate gun. And uh, I'm proud to be uh, one of the, uh, the guys who uh, represented and, uh, and helped design it. So, it's near and dear to my heart at, at that point, but uh, at, before it uh, actually came out, I didn't have any, uh, I have no more combat deployments, so I never got a chance to, uh, to use this one in combat. So that brings us up to the Mark 18. This is what our guys are getting issued now. Of course, this is a civilian version with a 16 inch barrel where the, the ones issued to the troops I have a 14 and a half inch barrel. Uh, the lower is the gun and you have the, the weapon suite guys are issued now has one lower and two uppers. The second upper, 10.3 inches or whatever. And then the new ones that they're coming out with the next mod, uh, they're gonna be 11 and a half inches. So somebody with a hundred pound brain is uh, making decisions and you know tweaking things uh, you know, to, to bring things uh, as modern as we can get this thing. But honestly, you know, even with the, you know, you've got new fancy lasers, uh, you know, electronic sights, all that cool stuff, backup irons that flip up. But when you look at this one, and then you look back to where it came from, I can still take this upper and put it on this lower, right? Not that much has changed and a lot has changed. and. As this goes on, we'll have more and more better equipment. I love it. You know, I don't get to use it anymore, but I'm training guys that, uh, that will. So thanks for going down uh, a little bit of memory lane with me, uh, checking out some, I think are pretty cool weapons. Hope you might've learned something. I know I did. If you like this kind of content, go ahead, leave me a comment, like, subscribe. You know what to do.